Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Revolution 250 podcast. I'm Bob Allison. I chair the Rev 250 Advisory Group, and we are a consortium of some 70 groups in Massachusetts looking at ways to commemorate the beginnings of American independence. And we have a very special guest today, Peter Abbott, who is the Consul General for His Majesty's Government here in Boston. So, Peter, thank you for joining us. Of course, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Bob. Now, it might be somewhat awkward to be the representative of the crown or the British government here in Boston where the revolution began. Can you tell us a bit about uh, your role as a consul? What does what is what is the consul general's main job? Well, I, Bob, I like to joke that uh, to be the British Consul General in Boston, you have to have pretty broad shoulders because I do get regularly invited to uh, things like uh, events commemorating the Boston Massacre, uh, Evacuation Day, uh, 4th of mm-hmm. July. Uh, so you have to be able to take all of uh, all of this with, uh, you know, with a, with a good deal of, um, of good humor um, uh, and, and, and make something interesting and light out of it. Um, mm-hmm. But most of the time, actually, I'll be honest, my work is not related to history. My work is very much focused on the present day. Um, the modern British relationship with Boston and the whole of New England, which I, uh, which I cover, uh, is very much focused on, uh, on the sciences, on emerging technologies like artificial intelligence and quantum, on biotechnology uh, and the life sciences, um, and on financial and professional business services, as well as things like climate tech, green tech, uh, renewable energy. So I spend a lot of my time uh, helping to support British companies in those areas who want to set up in, in Boston or New England, or indeed American companies in this part of the world who are interested in uh, exporting to UK or um, uh, investing there. So it's a very modern relationship, and the, the history uh, is just a lovely sort of sideline that I get to do from time to time. That, that's good. And of course, the consulate's been here since 1817. It is one of the earliest uh, consulates in the United States. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And um, it would be it'd be very difficult for me to do all of those uh, wonderful modern things if we didn't have, if, if, our, if our shared history didn't, uh, I think, open doors for us. I mean, I, I, I think that, uh, that uh, my Irish colleague and my Italian colleague uh, probably have a sort of a similar... Uh, mm-hmm. A similar long relationship with Boston, uh, not quite as long as ours, of course, but um, right. you know they have a right. similarly strong relationship. Right, and you, know, the, the, you have a wonderful house your for your residence on Beacon Hill, and it's one of the Bullfinch House designed back in the early 19th century. And in your reception room, you had at least the last time I was there, you had George Washington facing Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, and that was really a good statement of this interesting relationship that we have had, the close friendship and this idea of um, people together in the Declaration of Independence. One of the lines that was taken out was a lament to the British public that we could have been a great people together, this idea that uh, we shared something. We both have learned to get along, really, since that unpleasantness in 1814, 1815. Yeah. Yeah, no, the, the, we have a number of pieces of artwork in the residence um, that all have a particular connection to uh, to Boston. Um, two of which I thought I might I might highlight uh, today. Um, we have a set of first we have a set of four prints uh, showing the USS Constitution sinking HMS Java, um, mm-hmm. and I think only the British would put up paintings of military defeat. Uh, in their principal yes. uh, representational residence, uh, yeah. but we have a very fine, uh, four very fine prints of the USS Constitution, uh, and in fact, uh, Commander B.J. Farrell, that the current commander of the USS Constitution, has been to the residence on a number of occasions, and she always uh, <laughs> quite likes to see old Ironsides up there. On yes. The wall. Yeah. Um, the other, uh, the other print that I like very much is, in fact, behind you, um, and uh, it's on the cover of your book, The American Revolution. Oh. It depicts. Uh, the the Battle of Bunker Hill. Um, right. And what's very interesting about that particular uh, painting and, the, and that print is that um, it depicts a, a, a British general about to uh, stopping one of his men uh, yes. running through the gentleman on the ground with a bayonet. Uh, and what's interesting, as I understand the history of, of, of that painting, is that uh, the, the two men recognized each other as having fought together in the French and Indian Wars yes. a few years previously. And what, for me, that represents very, very clearly is the fact that the American Revolution was not a, 
a sort of a conventional war, as it were, between two foreign adversaries. Mm -hmm. It was much closer uh, to being a civil war uh, mm -hmm. between two yes. people who shared uh, very, very deep uh, family connections, trade connections, and connections of friendship as well. Yes, and the painting also shows um, Major Pitcairn being shot, and he's falling into the arms of his son, who is a Marine officer, and that you have this these ideas of family ties are very yeah. strong in the painting. And in the, you know, Trumbull was doing this, you know, within about 30 years, he had been in Boston or as part of the siege, he wasn't at Bunker Hill, but he's doing this piece really representing this moment when these people who did share a lot of history were coming apart, having a really a civil war. That's, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I'm surprised you don't have a picture, say, of the Chesapeake and the Shannon showing a British victory over an American ship. But it's a good, very good taste for you to show the Constitution defeating the Java. <laughs> well, we like to be local. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Um, now, uh, back in 1976, which was much long before your time, for part of the bicentennial, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth visited Boston, and it really was one of the highlights for us of the bicentennial. Uh, the Queen arrived on her yacht, the Britannia, and spent the day in Boston. She spoke from the balcony of the old uh, old State House, had lunch at City Hall with Mayor White and other dignitaries, and utterly charmed everyone, as she could do. It was one of the real high points. And then had a parade through the North End. She went to the um, Old North Church, she and Prince Philip, and then visited the USS Constitution. And it is said that when she was looking at the cannon on the ship that all had the mark of George the Third, she said that when we get home, we'll have to talk to the defense minister about these foreign arms sets. <laughs> she had a she had a wonderful way about her, and um, as you and your listeners know, that uh, last year we we celebrated her platinum jubilee uh, in really in the sort of the first half of the year, and then of course very sadly she passed away. Uh, in, in, in September of, of, of last year. Um, uh, but before she passed away, we just had several lovely moments of commemoration of that jubilee and commemoration of her visit mm -hmm. to Boston uh, in 1976. We held a, a service of praise and thanksgiving uh, at the Old North Church, uh, where, as you said, uh, she worshipped with, mm -hmm. with her husband. And in fact, on that occasion, I read uh, the prayer uh, that the Duke of Edinburgh, the then Duke of Edinburgh, um, read out uh, in that during that service. So there's some really, really nice points of connection. Um, and then, of course, at the end of last year, we had her grandson uh, here in Boston. Um, right. Uh, then yes. uh, the, the, the the Prince of Wales and the then Duke of Cambridge uh, for the uh, the Earthshot Prize, uh, which was a terrific yes. celebration of a modern. Uh, focus of ours, climate technology and climate innovation solutions, um, with with a very senior member of the royal family, and that was another chance to think about those those connections. In fact, when um, uh, when the prince and princess of Wales were here, they they met Mayor Wu in City Hall, um, and as they were coming out of, uh, I don't know how many listeners know the inside uh, detail of City Hall, but as they were coming out of the mayor's office and walking down the passageway. Uh, there was a very conscious attempt to recreate a famous photo of Mayor White walking down that same corridor uh, with uh, with Queen Elizabeth um, uh, several decades previously. So some really nice uh, points of connection to that yes. visit. It, it was pouring rain, and um, it was awful. I have, and, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a good friend, Robert Severy, who takes has been taking pictures in Boston since 1960, and he was there taking pictures of. Um, Prince William and Princess uh, Catherine, and he had taken pictures of Queen Elizabeth II back in 1976. And much better weather for the Queen's visit than for at least that day. Other, it did clear up the next day. Than the next day's. Well, it, it, it did clear up, but the next day was bitterly cold. Um, yeah. And uh, we went with the mayor to um, Piers Park uh, in East Boston, just across the river, yeah. and did a series of. Uh, events they're looking at um, climate resilience on on the mm -hmm. shoreline there, uh, and the the Prince and Princess of Wales were extraordinarily uh, tough and and uh, exhibited that classic sort of British stiff upper lip in the. In, right. I mean, it was absolutely freezing cold. I was worried that they were going to uh, they were going to turn into icicles, but uh, generally 
<laughs> generally the weather was 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 okay um mm -hmm. uh, not quite as warm as the welcome that they got from boston though yeah they did so so what are the chances that they will come back or that king charles will come back for the 250th well i think um what i could probably say is i've got no inside scoop i'll say that uh up front i think though there is probably a decent chance that a senior member of the British royal family will come uh, to America. I can't mm -hmm. promise you it will necessarily be to Boston, but will come to America uh, in 2026 for, for the 250th um, uh, anniversary. If you'll have us, of course, it's your anniversary, not ours. So you know that there has to be <laughs> there has to be an invitation. Well, okay. Well, 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 we'll see about getting getting one. I know they don't yeah. won't show up uninvited. Right, exactly. It would be a bit strange. Yeah, we were, yes. Yeah. No, no, we were talking about the, the, the fact that currently the Prime Minister of the UK is um, Rishi Sunak, who is from descended from India. And so we have separation of these countries, but reconciliation, or at least you know, just just to back up. My mother spent some years in the Middle East. Her closest friend was a woman from England and the two of them traveled together and they traveled through India. And whenever they stopped, people would look very surprised when at a hotel receiving the passports of these two women, one English, one American, and asked English and American traveling together. And my mother said, well, maybe when you have been independent of them for as long as we have, you'll travel with them too. I, I'm just thinking about the prospect, had we not had the revolution, think about if the United States, if the Americans were part of the British Empire, we could imagine any of our 19th or 20th century political figures also rising to positions of prominence in the empire. Had Lord North and the ministry not so badly miscalculated in 1776, I'm not asking you to atone or to justify, but simply to think about this possibility. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, you know, you can play some amazing sort of mental games and wonder, wonder what if. But I, I do think uh, it's important that we try and imagine these things because there is a tendency in history, and you know this as a, as a professor and a writer of, of history, uh, a tendency to assume that history was supposed to be the way that it was. And there's also sort of feels this sort of great kind of logic, to, particularly in American history, this sort of great progress towards freedom, this sort of um, inevitable progress towards greater freedom, greater expansion, um, and then the sort of inevitability of America's role in the world as, as the sort of preeminent superpower. But, um, you know, an awful lot hinged on some, some very sort of, in some ways, some very insignificant policies in, in, the, in, the, right. in the context of the British Empire at the time. Um, the idea of taxing the colonies, well, it was a no-brainer. Um, right. And, you know, why, why would you not do that? Because mm. it was expensive to run an empire and, and the colonialists needed to needed to pay something to, for the upkeep. Um, so it wasn't a ridiculous thing to do. And but just imagine if it, if, if it hadn't, if, if it's been dealt slightly differently, maybe Lord North hadn't closed the port of Boston when he did, <clears throat> you know, could this have gone a different way? And it would be, you know, amazing to think of America being much more like Canada, for example, or Australia uh, mm -hmm. in its connections to uh, to Britain. That's, that's true. And of course, um, you know, Churchill's mother was an American and we have developed these connections later. But you're right. The, there, there's no reason the history would have happened the way it did. And it is these small things. And of course, this year we're commemorating the 250th anniversary of the destruction of the tea. And when Parliament passed the Tea Act, Massachusetts's reaction was the last thing on their mind. They're really thinking about India and thinking about the real uh, future of the empire seemed to be in India as opposed to in North America. Yeah, yeah, no, you're 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 absolutely you're absolutely right. Um, and uh, you know, I, I I would love America to be to be more closely bound to to Britain to maybe be part of the Commonwealth, uh, for example. But um, it is it is still hard to imagine. You don't have to imagine there are no two countries in the world that have a closer relationship uh, now than Britain and America, mm -hmm. whether it's in, in trade terms, whether it's in terms of scientific collaboration uh, or whether it's in terms of the kind of the people to people links and the, the creative connections between us or whether it's a, the military level, which is really the military level has been the heart of the special relationship since the end of, of World War Two. So right. really, really very deep connections all the way from the very top of your leadership structures all the way down to, to the sort of people-to-people -people links. 
um, in everyday life. We're talking with Peter Abbott, who is the Consul General for the United Kingdom here in Boston. And uh, you've spent uh, 20 some odd years in foreign service. I mean, you have an interesting trajectory before that, but you've been posted to West Africa, to uh, Pakistan and to Lisbon. And I'm just wondering if you could, well, what brought you into foreign service as a career? Uh, well, I'm afraid it's a rather disappointing answer. Um, uh, people tend to like or tend to hope that I will say that um, I dreamt of being a diplomat since I was sort of knee high to a grasshopper and, and that this was this was the vocation that I always saw myself doing. But uh, the truth of the matter is I never really knew what I wanted to do. Um, and so uh, rather dilettante like I sort of skipped through several things and um, I decided that none of them were quite for me. And I went back to to Cambridge and I did a, a PhD and as I was coming to the end of the PhD I realized well academia really wasn't for me at all and with apologies to you Bob and apologies to any of your listeners who might be academics I found um, uh, certainly the English faculty uh, sort of arguing about things that didn't seem to me to really be of particularly great importance uh, in the world so um, well that, that hasn't changed I, I'm sure I'm sure it's very different at American universities oh yeah yeah um, <laughs> Uh, and so I knew I didn't want to be an academic, um, mm -hmm. but I didn't know what I wanted to do. And, and the, the girl that I was dating at the time, um, she was far more practical than I was and said, well, Peter, look, you have to have a plan. Um, the deadline for the Foreign Office, the, the British Foreign Service is coming up. I think you should give it a shot. So I thought, well, you know, I've always liked to travel. My parents, my grandparents were all in public service. Maybe this, maybe this makes sense. So um, I applied um, and I, I started to... You, it takes about a year to get into the British Foreign Service, rather like the State Department. You have to go through a whole series of different exams and tests and things. And I was convinced that I would fail at the first one and that would be it and it would be fun, but that would be over. But I didn't. I passed the first one and then lo and behold, I passed the second and, and the third. And I thought, well, maybe I actually have a shot at this. And by that point, this girl and I had broken up uh, rather acrimoniously. Um, uh, so we're, we're not in touch. And I don't, so I don't know whether she knows that that suggestion that she made all those years ago actually ended mm. up being, being, uh, being a British diplomat and having done it for, uh, for, for nearly 20 years. So, um, uh, it's, uh, it's been quite a ride, as you said, but I've had some fantastic places, some fantastic postings. Mm. Uh, it's been a real privilege. It's amazing. It, and so now you and your wife and three children are living in Boston and, so they are growing up not in the UK, but here. I wonder how that is for a British family living in Boston. Well, they are a British American family. So my wife is uh, American okay. uh, and uh, I met her in Washington, D.C. on my first posting. Uh, so our children are dual uh, U.S. U.K. citizens. So the living embodiment of the uh, of the special relationship. Right. And in fact, one of the reasons we came to Boston was because there was a sort of slightly it was an unspoken agreement really with my wife that at some point we would come and do a posting uh, in the US so she could be a bit closer to her family. Um, but uh, no, it's been, it's been a terrific run. Uh, our eldest son was born in London. Uh, our two, uh, the two younger children were both born in Lisbon in Portugal. Um, hmm. And they moved to, to Pakistan uh, for a few years and then here to Boston. Wow. So um, I don't know how British they feel, how American they feel, but I hope they feel yeah. That they've got a sense of being uh, being internationalists, I suppose. Right. Interesting. And you spent some of your childhood visiting in places like Williamsburg, Yorktown, in, here on this side of the ocean, and actually in Virginia, which has its own revolutionary history. Yeah. No, that's right. My my father was a was a was a teacher, and he was in education, and um, he made all sorts of fantastic connections with teachers in in the U.S. and um, so we spent a lot of our uh, our childhood summers uh, swapping houses uh, with teachers in in America would would come mm. to the UK and stay in our house and we would we would stay in their house um, and we had some very good friends who lived in Reston in Northern Virginia and we we often came and stayed with with them um, and we uh, my parents took us to Colonial Williamsburg in 1988 mm. um, and we must have gone back to Colonial Williamsburg every year for the better part of a decade. Um, and uh, we would also go to, you mentioned Yorktown, we also went to Jamestown, 
uh, mm -hmm. a lot. Uh, if I, we found Jamestown really quite moving. I mean, for those of your listeners who've been to been to Jamestown, it's actually not very developed in the way that Colonial Williamsburg has a right. you know a, a whole sort of infrastructure around it. Uh, Jamestown still feels when you drive out there, it still feels, or you can imagine that it still feels the way that it, it would have felt when those those first settlers uh, arrived. Uh, you go out into the marshes, you're just sort of surrounded by by nature. And when you go in the summer and you're on summer holiday, it feels lovely, but you could imagine uh, with with no infrastructure whatsoever, the mosquitoes, and then in the winter time, the, the bitter, bitter cold, uh, mm -hmm. not really knowing how to live in this environment. It's very moving. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, one of the most moving things at Jamestown is quite a small uh, plank uh, that was put into the ground actually quite a long time ago now by the Law Society uh, in, in, in England. Uh, and it commemorates the uh, the links between the Magna Carta, uh, common law, um, mm -hmm. and the foundation of the legal uh, structure uh, here in the United States. So just one of those planks, I guess, one of those things that really binds our two countries. Yes. Yeah. I, I, in the prints of one of one of the prints of Boston in the 1760s has Magna Carta above the town that's about to be occupied by British troops and uh, Paul Revere's silver bowl, yeah. which you can see at the MFA, there is Magna Carta that is they're taking. This is the heritage that they are trying to preserve against what yeah. they see as a parliament changing the rules. We're talking with Peter Abbott, who is the Consul General for the United Kingdom here in Boston, and we're talking about uh, the special relationship which he and his family embody, but also the two countries have enjoyed really since 1815. Um, so, so how do you, I mean, so this is the connection that the two countries have, or one that we share, and it is very moving to see this representation at the time of the revolution and since that we're preserving these same liberties that people in England were thought to enjoy. And that's really, I think, one of the critical things about the revolution. Yeah, yeah. And it, and it goes back to something I said earlier, that there is a tendency now for Americans to think that, you know, to see Britain as the tyrant. And, and you know, I, I often have to go to events where people stand up before me and talk about um, how your, your your brave men threw off the yoke of the tyrant and mm -hmm. you know the sort of the jackboot of the the the, 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 the dictator on 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 the, yeah. the throat of, of the sort of the colonial American it wasn't like that at all it's not really that's not really how it felt as you say they were trying to they were trying to protect a right that English men and English women had in Britain at the time it wasn't they were, weren't asking for anything different and i think it's really important yeah. to see that history through through that lens that um the connections and the love of britain were very very strong um but the actions of the of the parliament and the king were just were just intolerable in fact they were mm. intolerable acts that's what we call them intolerable acts. Yeah. the last straw right <laughs> right yeah 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 that's right and george the third saw himself as a patriot king that is he is the sovereign over this empire and you know so he's not posing he, he's not expanding his power it's uh, parliament doing these things actually in the best interest they thought of the empire not realizing how badly they were miscalculating the fact that the yeah. you know the anticipating that the americans well i think uh, sir henry clinton said we'll just pull out to canada and florida and let the americans fight among themselves and they'll get tired of killing each other and they'll ask us to come back the idea that yeah. they could actually unite seem yeah. very far-fetched yeah you yeah, know no, exactly and uh, you know uh, as you said i live on beacon hill and uh, every time i cross charles street or look at the river i think well you know you've changed a lot of your names and a lot of roads i think have yeah. have, have road old street names were changed after independence but uh, mm -hmm. the charles river is still the charles river uh, for, right. a, for a reason that's right and hanover street is still hanover, hanover street. street yeah yeah, but yeah, um, so so Charles the first, and then Charles, and now of course we have Charles the third. Um, it's been a long time since there was a Charles as king. I mean, there have been many Georges since George the third. It's uh, I, I I don't know. We don't really need to discuss the naming uh, naming of English monarchs. It's just um, interesting. Jonathan points out that up until 1775 or so, every statement about the rights of New England began with a statement of their loyalty to the crown, that yeah. they 
uh, it wasn't the crown; it was the the ministry that was upsetting the upsetting the balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I um I, I know it was it was uh, thrown down from the roof of the old state house, but um, I do uh, I do love walking past the old state house now and seeing uh, those great symbols of right. royal power: the, the the lion and the unicorn, uh, representing England and Scotland uh, up there on the roof of the old state house. It's a lovely lovely thing to see. And in fact, we have the same crest is on the outside of the residence on on Beacon Hill. So there's. Uh, there's a little yeah. bit of royal imagery still around in Boston. There is, and Bostonians did become somewhat more Anglophilic after, in the early 19th century, than they had been. And Beacon Hill really, the streets of Beacon Hill really were designed to look kind of like a fashionable London district with Lewisburg Square, which commemorates another American British expedition against the French. And, you know, we were talking earlier, you know, the French really are engaged in the war on the American side. And it doesn't turn out that well for them. The Americans and the British have a, had a special relationship and things go badly between the Americans and the French in the 1790s and later. There's a wonderful story at Yorktown about one of the French officers taunting one of the British officers about how they've lost these three million subjects and. Uh, they will now be independent. And the British officer says, yes, they'll be independent and they will all speak English. It was incredibly prophetic. Um, and I, I, you know, we were discussing earlier, I do sometimes think that if I was, if I was French, I would feel a tremendous sense of injustice uh, that the French supported the Americans in that crucial, you know, crucially in, in some of those battles. Um, and yet, you know, I have to be careful what I say. The, you know, the French have a tremendous relationship with America. They're very yes, good. They, they do. Yes, very. Strong and you're not people. you're not speaking officially now for His <laughs> Majesty's government. You're just speaking as a guy. No. <laughs> but you know, I would still feel that it just wasn't really very fair that they gave all this military assistance and we all ended yeah. up speaking English. <laughs> yeah. 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 So. So. Um, You've lived really all over the world, and I'm one. I, I guess each assignment must have both its own challenges as well as its own difficulties. So, um, in Islamabad, in Mali, in Lisbon, and in America, is there are there easier assignments than others? There, there are, but it's all in sort of different ways, really. Um, so uh, Portugal was our, our first posting overseas, which was uh, a really wonderful place to raise a family. As I mentioned earlier, two of our three children were born there, and it's um, uh, it's a wonderfully um, it's a wonderfully sort of peaceful and low key society. Um, very close connections to Britain, very close historic connections. In fact. The relationship between Portugal and England is the is the uh, is the oldest extant diplomatic relationship anywhere in the world. Um, uh, and when uh, when we had the the uh, the 800th anniversary of the Magna Carta was in 2018, I think, or 2017. Um, and we actually got one of the copies, the Herefordshire Cathedral, the Hereford Cathedral um, copy of the Magna Carta did a global tour, and we brought mm -hmm. it to Portugal and we placed it in the Portuguese National Archives alongside the, with the, the Treaty of Windsor, uh, which mm -hmm. was almost contemporaneous with the Magna Carta. So a very, very long connection between Portugal and England and a lovely country, a lovely culture, lovely society, mm -hmm. a very nice place to be. Um, and then we uh, we went to Pakistan, which was, was quite different. Uh, and again, you know, very, very long associations with Britain. Um, not always happy associations, of course, um, you know, very, very uh, difficult period immediately leading up to, to Pakistani independence with partition of India and um, uh, the war with, as it was, uh, East Pakistan there with, with, with Bangladesh. Um, so very, very difficult genesis, but now very, very deep uh, mm -hmm. ties. In fact, our High Commission in Islamabad, which is the name that we give uh, our embassies in Commonwealth countries. So our High Commission in Islamabad, uh, certainly when I was there, was our largest mission overseas, anywhere in the world, um, and uh, reflects, I think, the real depth of those people-to-people -people, 
uh, links mm -hmm. between Britain and, and Pakistan. So we had a lovely time there. And we were, we were fortunate, in fact, to be there um, at a point at which, uh, for about a decade before we arrived, all of the indices of, of, of violence um, that were associated, I think, in the sort of post 9-11 period, have been mm -hmm. declining. And in fact, it was a relatively safe place to be. So uh, my family and I, we, we just enjoyed a really wonderful mm -hmm. sense of freedom around the country, that the people, the music, the food, the landscape, mm -hmm. everything was was extraordinary. Um, and we were there when the, when the pandemic struck uh, oh, and goodness. we all suddenly had to, mm -hmm. you know, like everyone around the world went into lockdown. Right. Um, but we we just weren't sure at that stage. Nobody really knew what the pandemic would bring. We didn't know whether the Pakistani healthcare system would be able to uh, to cope with it. In the end, actually, in those first few months of the pandemic, Pakistani society wasn't hugely affected. It was affected much worse in, I think, the second wave of the pandemic, as as India was as well. Um, and then we left Pakistan and we came to Boston. Um, and uh, you know, it's just been a terrific posting. It's been the most intellectually stimulating of any job uh, that I've done. I mean, I can, I'm sitting here in Kendall Square, uh, where, the, where the consulate is actually in Cambridge, right. uh, and I could throw a stone and, you know, I'd probably hit a Nobel Prize winner or somebody, uh, yes, you know, yes. doing something really extraordinary, really the sort of world changing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so being a part of that atmosphere has been, uh, has been really terrific. I would say, though, I mean, you know, one of the one of the things I've loved about this job, but has also been difficult, is this is my first representational role where um, I have to I have to entertain. I live in a representational mm. property, uh, right. so I have overnight visitors. We have receptions, we have dinners, etc. Mm. Um, and whilst that is literally the bread and butter of a diplomat, it's quite a lot. It's quite a heavy load, and you you have yeah. to get used to being something of a public uh, mm -hmm. of a public figure. Um, I'm not going to claim that I'm famous, but you know, you, you know, there's just always in the back of your mind when you're out and about. Well, you know, you should probably behave in a certain way just in case somebody says, "Well, isn't that the British Consul General losing his mm -hmm. rag with his children or whatever it is?" You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's, yeah, uh, that, that definitely is, is challenge. Um, now, you started off actually. You have a doctorate studying Greek tragedy, and I suppose uh, that that's. Uh, I, I can see why you would have given up academia, and I wonder how much the the Greeks come up in your dealings with um, in your diplomatic duties. Well, it wasn't it wasn't Greek tra Greek tragedy wasn't the reason I gave up academia. It was academics, uh, not the yeah. Not I can see not, that. Yeah, <laughs> not the subject. Um, yeah. uh, so I I uh, in, in my final year as an undergraduate, um, Cambridge University, the English faculty has a famous relatively famous thing called the, the tragedy paper where you're introduced to, to tragedy, Shakespearean tragedy, Greek tragedy, Elizabethan tragedy, modern tragedy, etc. Um, and uh, the way that the paper is taught is it really encourages you to think about tragedy in, in its broadest possible sense, from the psychological, mm -hmm. political, uh, all sorts of angles, as well as from literary uh, angles. And it really fired up my interest. And I wrote a paper in that, in that final year on Timothy McVeigh, now, if you don't know if you remember, Timothy McVeigh was one of the open yeah, yeah. Um, And I, I wrote this piece about, about tragedy and terrorism that was really interesting to me. And this was mm. uh, May or June of 2000 mm -hmm. uh, when I graduated. Um, no, sorry, May, June 2001. May, June 2001. Yeah. So three months later, I've graduated from uh, university. Three or four months later, we have 9-11. Uh, the biggest terrorist attack uh, mm. of, that anybody can, can remember. And I had just moved to the United States uh, to work for a lady named Ariana Huffington, who um, I worked for for, for, a, for a year. She was a writer and a columnist, and I helped her out with some of, uh, some of her writing and, and research and fact-checking and things. She ran for governor of California. She did. She ran for governor of California, exactly. Um, but uh, after that, those terrorist attacks of 9-11, I just couldn't get out of my head uh, how important it was to think about how the ancient Greeks dealt with terror and dealt with fear in their societies mm -hmm. and uh, sort of uh, sublimated it through through drama and through public public theatre. Uh, and so I really wanted to go back to back to Cambridge and, and study, uh, do a PhD mm -hmm. on tragedy and terrorism. That's really what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, the problem was, is that that was just deemed to be 
too too wide a field. Uh, mm -hmm. So every everyone I spoke to said, oh, well, you can't do that. That's sort of literature, that's sort of classics, that sort yeah, of yeah. politics, that sort of mm -hmm. you know, international affairs. You know, you're shaking your head, Bob. I can see, you know, you're like, that's just not going to fly at a university. No, no, no. I'm shaking my head because that's exactly what people will tell you to stop you right. from doing something really interesting. Right. <laughs> so in the end, I, um, I narrowed it right down and I, 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 I did something more classically literary uh, while still having a nod to... Uh, to, to terrorism, but that was really that was what drove me to my interest in 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 Greek tragedy. I can see that. I mean, that's a, it's a fascinating story, a fascinating subject. And again, it is the way academics work to try to narrow you down and prevent you from doing something. Uh, maybe in your retirement, you can get back to uh, <laughs> the Greeks and the terrorism and tragedy. Which is, uh, Always will, always sadly will be a timely subject, and the Greeks always will be um, timely. One of my good friends who was a, uh, a politician, but also a Greek scholar, he had a mentor who said, if you have the Greeks, you don't need anyone else. No, no exactly. But, but I think we are going through a period uh, in, in sort of academic uh, circles where humanities, uh, English literature, drama are being questioned like never before. Oh, yeah. um, and, and I think we, those of us who believe that the humanities are worth studying, uh, need to be pretty vocal in our defense of them, uh, because it's hard to argue why somebody shouldn't go and do an engineering degree, uh, or instead they should study poetry. Mm -hmm. um, right. so we have to yeah. be quite sophisticated in our arguments. Very true. And do you have any good arguments to help us make, help us in the academy make? I think um, I think studying literature in all its forms uh, is a wonderful way to build empathy uh, with other people mm -hmm. um, and uh, helps us put ourselves in other people's shoes. And I think more and more now we are being this is a sort of identity politics yeah. tells you that you can never understand the trials mm -hmm. and tribulations of another person. Um, uh, and I don't think that's true. I think mm -hmm. with a sufficiently well-developed sense of, of empathy and understanding, we can meet all sorts of people and try and understand where they've come from. And literature helps us get better uh, at doing that. It helps us to test out ideas um, and to sort of train ourselves to be better at being empathetic and better at understanding um, other people's perspectives. Amen. That's, uh, th thank you. We, we've been talking with Peter Abbott, who is the Consul General for the United Kingdom here in Boston, a career, so far career foreign service since uh, other stints in academia and in American politics, and now fortunately as a representative of the British government, and fortunately here in Boston, uh, as well as in Cambridge. So Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Of course, it's a pleasure, Bob, thank you. And I want to thank Jonathan Lane, our producer, and our listeners. You know, Peter, we thought we'd have a handful of folks around Boston tuning in, but actually we have a pretty wide listenership, people all over the world. And so every week I like to acknowledge some of them in different places. And if you are in one of these places listening in, send Jonathan Lane an email, jlane at revolution250.org, and he'll send you some of our Revolution 250 swag as we prepare for the 250th events, I think. So... And this week, they're all places you may know, Southampton and Bristol and London, Edinburgh and Livingston and West Lothian, uh, Sydney, Melbourne and Auckland, Burgess Hill and West Sussex, and Huddersfield and Kirklees. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you all folks in between. Thank you, Peter Abbott. And now we will be piped out on the road to Boston.